Hey, Linda. Hey, Mr. Salmon. What's going on? Nothing much. We'll wait a couple minutes, see if anyone else shows up. All right, Linda. So I got a question for you. Um, you and I seem to be the only ones here. Um, I can go ahead and do the notes with you if you want, or you can come back at one o'clock. So it's up to you. Oh, uh, you can go ahead and do the notes now. Okay. All right. That's that's fine. Did you look over the last set of notes by chance? No, I'm kind of. Oh, what the? You, it's in our blue packet, right? Um, should be the, yeah, it should be the, the smaller one that's got reconstruction on the front of it. Okay, yeah, I have it. Okay. Um, let's see, anything, uh, stand out to you in particular, or you have any questions on before I get started? I don't really have any questions. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, uh, go through them, and, um, I'll pause between each day's worth. So the first set um, basically deals with uh, Grant's presidency. Um, remember, Grant um, is the big war hero from the Civil War. Um, he never ran for office before, so he's got no experience being in Congress. He was never a governor. Um, so the, him being president is the first time he was ever involved in politics. And he was not prepared for it very well. Um, so when he runs for elect re-election in 72, you have several Republicans agreeing with the Democrats that Graft is ruining the Republican Party and America. Um, let's see. Um, were you here last week when we did the uh, notes? Yes. Okay, so um, do you remember the the one of the one of the money problems with Reconstruction? You had um, carpetbaggers and other people who were scamming people, saying, "Hey, you know, we're going to fix up this stuff," but they never got around to it, or they would yeah. overcharge for yeah, yeah. 
So that was graft. And so, you know, as time went on, you know, people saw that as more and more of an issue. And so you have a group of Republicans break off. And these guys are called liberal Republicans because they want to change how the Republican Party works. And they pick a guy by the name of Horace Greeley, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And the Democrats picked him also. And so he's going to run for president against Grant in um, 1872. And let me show you what he looks like. Oh, I got a new little thing now. I don't know the difference, so I'm just going to do what I've been doing. There we go. So you see him? Yeah. Yeah, with some weird neck hair. I don't know what the deal with that is. Um, so that's Horace Greeley. He ran against Grant. Grant wins a second term anyway, but Greeley kind of makes history because he is the only person to run for president to die in the middle of the election. So when they actually had to vote, like half of the electors didn't know what to do and half of them voted for a dead guy. So I don't really know how that works, but Grant wins the election. Um, Grant's got two big problems he is trying to deal with, and he doesn't deal with either of them very well. One of them is called the Whiskey Ring, um, where his Secretary of War has to resign. Um, he was caught taking bribes. Um, his personal secretary and other people who worked for him also took money, but they weren't punished. And so Grant looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, some people who don't like Grant as a person think he was in on it, but there's no evidence of that. But, but you know, Grant looks bad. Um, and then you got the Panic of 1873, which I think you did the warm-up on, correct? Yeah. Okay. Where you have the economy going down for three straight years. And this is back in the day when the government didn't get involved in the economy. That didn't really start to happen until the 20th century. And so... But, you know, that angers ordinary people that, the, you know, the, the economy sucks and whose fault is it? Well, it's the president's fault. You know, that's always been true. And so um, that's another reason that people want some, something new in office. Um, Grant has served eight years, but Grant was, you know, talking to his friends and people who were close to him like, hey, you know, maybe I should run for a third term. You know, there's nothing legally stopping me, but he was so unpopular by his eight years in office, um, the Republicans didn't want him back. And so they pick uh, somebody else we'll get to in a minute. While all this is going on, you've got the Redeemers in the South. Um, last time, I think I showed you that map of Reconstruction in the South. Am I correct? Yes. And there were two sets of dates in each state. And the date on the bottom that was underlined, those are the dates where the, the, the states were redeemed. That's what the South called it, where the Democrats, the people who were supposed to be in charge, quote, unquote, got their power back from, you know, the Republicans or some people call them the black Republicans because they thought the Republicans were just puppets of, you know, African-Americans. And so the Redeemers, they don't care about racial violence. They don't care about discrimination. You know, some of them are in the Klan. Some just don't care. Um, and by 1876, all but three southern states had been redeemed by the Democrats. And 1876 is an important year because guess what political events going on in 1876? Mm. The, I want to say the election, but not uh, you, you are right, it is the election. Uh, and so, 1876 is going to be a hot mess of an election, and I'm trying to find a good resolution map that will show it. Yeah, that's good enough, I think it'll work. Oh, I'm at 200, that's why. All right, so let me put this up here. Oh, 
present the screen. So in 1876, uh, you got two guys running for president. It's a traditional looking election. You got Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, going up against Samuel Tilden, the Democrat. Um, and it's it's a mess because it looks clean. Like if you look at the graph, it says, oh, 185, 184, you know, Hayes wins. But it wasn't. Um, it was the most messy election we've ever had because there were 20 electoral votes that were in dispute. And so, like, if you add Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, 8 and 7 is 15, plus 4 is 19, and then there was one in Oregon that were in dispute. And if Tilden got any one of those votes, Tilden becomes president. Tilden thought he deserved those votes because – the Democrats were saying, well, those southern states down there, you know, they are they got the Union Army in there telling them how to vote, and, you know, you can't really trust them. And Hayes is saying, well, yeah, they're, they're down there because they're protecting the rights of African Americans, and they should have voted for me because that's what they want. And so neither side is willing to give up to the other and so they come up with this special electoral commission, which is not in the Constitution, but both sides agreed to hold it so nobody can stop it. And so they're going to investigate and they're going to try to figure out who wins. And so what they finally agree to, a co literally two days before the inauguration, I mean, it is March 2nd when they agree to this, and they didn't inaugurate presidents back in the day until March 4th. So March 2nd, they agree to give all of the disputed votes to Hayes. So Hayes becomes president, all right? But the Democrats would be pissed because the Democrats are like, well, hey, that's not fair. We really won those states. So to get the Democrats to agree to this, the compromise says that Hayes becomes president, but the Democrats will get something out of it because all of those troops that are in the South are going to go home. Reconstruction's going to be over. Nobody's going to look out for African-American rights on a federal level. So if states want to discriminate, the federal government's going to look the other way. And we're also going to build more railroads down in the South to help their economy pick up better. And they put a redeemer or two on the cabinet. So it looks like Hayes wins if you look at the map, but how long does a president serve at any given time? Four years. Correct. So Hayes is president for four years, but the South gets what it wants for decades and decades. It's not until the 1950s and 60s. That's 80, 90 years later that people start saying, hey, wait a minute, African-Americans are supposed to have rights. Why is this not happening? So the South does way better in the compromise than the Republicans in the North does. And it's, it's pretty sad, but that's how it turned out. Um, so now that Reconstruction's over, you have these two different pictures of the South. You have what is called the New South, you know, this idea that the South has changed for the better. Uh, the South is more... Um, industrialized. You have railroads built all around the South. You got iron and steel factories in Birmingham, Alabama. You have textile and tobacco factories in North Carolina. Textile factories, remember, used to be up in New England where all the mills were. Now you have a lot of them in North Carolina. You had them in North Carolina until not too long ago. Had some in Lexington until about 15, 20 years ago. Um, then you get the old South, you know, the idea that the South says it's changed, but it really hasn't changed by the year 1994% of people in the South. And this isn't just African Americans. This is everybody. 94% of everybody with a job in the South were farmers in the year 1900. And that's crazy. And African Americans basically have no legal power at all. Um, you know, they're, they're going to stop them from voting. They're going to segregate them. All that stuff's going to happen by the year 1900. 
Um, for most African Americans, of course, like we said, they're farmers. Whites are farmers too, but it's different for African Americans because most African Americans do not own the land that they farm. Um, a few of them that are lucky are what are called tenant farmers, where they, you know, live on the land. They can farm whatever they want to farm. They can work however they want to work, as long as they pay what to the person who owns the land. Um. Uh, is it like half of what they get? Well, that's that's different. That's sharecropping. But a tenant farmer, all they have to do is pay cash. If they pay cash to the person who owns the land, they can do whatever they want. They can grow tobacco, cotton, apples, livestock, chickens. It's totally up to them. And they can work as hard as they want. They can take days off if they want. The landlord doesn't care as long as the landlord gets paid. And that's as good as it gets for most African Americans in the South because most of them don't have the money to buy land. And even if they did, a lot of places would restrict where they could buy. So, you know, the, the land that was available usually wasn't high producing type land. Um, so tenant farming is as good as most of them had. It. Um, what most African Americans had to live under was the sharecropping model, which you started to describe where basically they don't have cash to pay rent. So instead, the person who owns the land says, that's okay. When it comes time to harvest your crop, you give me a percentage of the crop or you give me a percentage of the money that you make, and that will be your rent. You know, you have a share of the crop. The problem was, the big problem was, um, the farmers also didn't have the money for tools, for food, for seeds, for farm animals that would, you know, like like donkeys or horses that would pull the the, you know, the the plows and the other equipment, and so they would have to get all these things from the landlord, who would give them credit for it, and so you would be in debt before the year would even start, and then you would have to pay rent on top of the debt. And so when it came time to harvest the crops, your share would not be enough to pay the debt off. You would still be in debt at the end of the year. And so since you were still in debt, the owner wouldn't let you off the land to move somewhere better because they say, hey, you owe me money and you can't leave until you pay the debt off. <laughs> so they were stuck on the land, um, you know, kind of like slavery. You know, they, they wouldn't buy and sell the people, but you were stuck on the land. You had to work. You had no choice. If you tried to leave the land and sneak off and go somewhere better, they could, you know, swear out a warrant for your arrest for, you know, like like running out on a restaurant bill. You know, they could you can be arrested for that. It would be the same thing. Um, so it was, it was an unfair system and it was purposely done that way. So the landlords would have a way to still make money off of cotton farming like they had before the war. And this was a way they could get, get around the, the, the loophole of, well, we can't have slaves. How are we going to do it? Oh, that's how we're going to do it. Um, so that's kind of how that all worked. Uh, questions as far as that goes. No. Okay. So this gets us to the very last notes of the whole entire course. You got pretty much two days. I, I kind of jammed mm -hmm. into one so we could get the notes um, knocked out. You got two topics. One deals with the Homestead Act, and this is Lincoln being really smart. And th this this set of notes, by the way, uh, overlaps with American too. But the Homestead Act is basically Lincoln's plan to say, hey, when the war is over, we need more people to move out west uh, to unite the country and make the west profitable. And so um, you, it starts off with this idea that we talked about a little bit in Unit 4, this idea that 
you know, white people didn't want to go out to the West because there was very few trees, very little water, you know, it's, it's not useful to civilization, but technology starts to change that. You start to come up with things like the steel plow that can cut through grass and roots and all that. Um, you start to come up with windmills that can draw water up from deep underground and water the crops. But the law that really gets people out there is the Homestead Act. And this idea is that the government is going to give settlers land if they go out there and they farm it and their families, of course, can go with them. They would get this homestead, which is what it was called, a plot of land that was 160 acres. Now, most of the houses near the high school are one quarter of one acre. So you take 640 of those houses, that's a homestead. It's a huge amount of land. All they got to do is build a house on the land farm the land for five years. They don't want rich people from New York to snatch up the land. They want ordinary people who want to farm, who want an honest chance to start over to go out there. There's only one group of people that are not allowed to take advantage of it besides Native Americans. I did that one year and somebody brought them up. I'm like, oops, yeah, I forgot about them. Um, do you, can you guess who they are? African Americans? Nope, they are allowed to take advantage of it. In fact, uh, you have almost a million African Americans, a lot of them from the South, say, screw this homestead crap. I'm going to sneak off and I, they ain't going to catch me. And they actually made it out to the West and homesteaded out there. There's a big mural of that in uh, Greensboro. There's like a shopping center you drive past on Cone Boulevard. And they, somebody painted a big mural about African-Americans who homestead in the West. It's pretty neat. Um, so want to try another guess? Um. Remember, this is passed in the middle of the Civil War. The, um, the... I don't know. Confederates. Oh. So that's, their, that's their punishment for fighting against their own country. So Confederates, anyone who supported the Confederates were in the Confederate military, they're not allowed to, but anybody else is. Um, so you have one and a half million people move out west and this is going to make America enormously wealthy because we're going to be able to sell these uh, agriculture products all over the world. And we're still selling them all over the world. Um, and you start to get um, colleges and universities to teach people to be more effective farmers. This is when you get a lot of your A&M schools and your A&T schools, like you get Texas A&M, um, you get you know, Florida A&M, you know, these are all done out of what's called the Morrill Land Grant Act, where the government was going to take parts of land out in the West and give it to states on the condition that they would build these agricultural colleges on the land. Um, it's not easy to live on the land. Um, you know, the water, these windmills, you got to drill deep, like 100, 200 feet down to hit water. It doesn't rain very much out there. Um, there's almost no wood. The houses are built out of sod like um, oh, on um, the Dances with Wolves movie. You saw what, like where the guy's living at, you know, that the, the barracks he's living in is built out of grass. Did you notice that? No, I never noticed. Um, but, but you, I mean, you saw the movie though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can't show it now because of what's, but yeah, that, that was built out of, they would, what the farmers would do in the West is they would cut out squares of grass, leave the grass there and then pull it out by the root and make little bricks out of it. And then they would stack the bricks on top of each other. And since it was so dry, they would, you know, if you do it in the summertime, they would, they would bake like uh, 
you know, like a clay pot in the kiln and, you know, they, you could actually build houses out of, out of the dirt. Um, the, they would uh, make fires out of buffalo manure because there were buffalo everywhere. They would just, you know, let it dry for a few days, pick it up with their bare hands and take it back to the house and they would burn it. And that's what they would use to keep their, their house warm in the winter. They would cook food with, buffalo manure i mean it must smell awful but that's what they would use um the summers are very hot the winters are very cold it's just on and off like a switch like you know um it'll be like 20 degrees in march and then a front will come through and it'll be 90 degrees the next week so it's just like the spring and, and fall are very rapid there's fires out there, swarms of insects that'll eat up your crops, drought, dust storms. Uh, this time of year, you get tornadoes and hailstorms out there. All of these can tear up your crops. If your tr crops get torn up, eaten up, wiped out, then the government's not going to help you. It's all a giant risk. And so if you can survive out there, Nobody cares what race you are. Nobody cares if you're a man or a woman. You get respect by making it in the West. And so you have groups of people called exodusters, which are African-American cowboys. And they're, they're treated the same as, as white cowboys out there. Uh, women, uh, this is the first part of the United States that is actually going to let women have the right to vote. Because if women can make it out there then they're tough and they're smart so they're like hey you know they deserve to vote but you know and, and states get to decide who is allowed to vote so they let women vote in the west um and this kind of gets into the transcontinental railroad too if you're going to move out if you're going to have all these people move out to the west and they got stuff they want to sell or supplies they need you need a good transportation network to get all that in and out of there and so Lincoln also got Congress to pass the Pacific Railway Act, where you're going to build this railroad that goes all the way across the country. But he was smart about it. He said, let's not have one railroad. If we can get it done in half the time if we have two get built at the same time and they get closer and closer to each other and it'll get done a lot faster. So he did that. The Railway Act also gave each railroad land on either side of the tracks because that would be a way for the railroad companies to want to do this, to get on board with it because once they finished it, they owned all of that land and they could, and anyone who owns land who needs money, guess what they can do with the land? They can use it. How um what's what's a quick way to make money off of land that you own? Farm sell. So, you can so. sell it. Yeah, you can sell the land, make money that way, or you can keep the land and rent it out to people and it'll do the same thing. And so this is why the government let the railroad companies own land for twenty miles sometimes on either side of the track. Um, the Union Pacific is the railroad company that still exists to this day. I've seen them a few times around here at Railroad Crossing. I'll show you a uh, picture of one in a minute. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, so that's a Union Pacific locomotive. Um, I've seen uh, cars. I haven't seen locomotives around here, but I've seen cars with that logo on them sometimes at railroad crossings. This one starts in Omaha, Nebraska, and goes west across the Great Plains. And then the Central Pacific starts in Sacramento, California. Omaha, Nebraska, and Sacramento, California was where the railroads stopped. Like there were a few railroads in California, but none of them went east of Sacramento because there were too many mountains. There were railroads east of Omaha, Nebraska, 
but none of them went past Omaha because that was all empty wasteland of the great American desert. Nobody thought it was worth it. So you start in those two cities and you get closer and closer until they meet. And they're going to meet up at Promontory Point, Utah, and you have the big uh, celebration, which you guys was on your um, warm-up today, and I saw, I think you already answered that question. But here's the, the famous picture of the opening of the railroad, one railroad coming from the west, one coming from the east. They meet up in Utah. And then if you look in the very middle, you see the the owners of the two railroads shaking hands. In the back, you got guys pouring champagne. But what's messed up about the picture is the fact that everybody in here is white and the, the Chinese workers who built half of the railroad were told to stay back out of the picture because you know they didn't want them to get any of the credit even though they built the hardest part of the railroad the chinese immigrants built the part that went up over the mountains coming out of california uh there were ten thousand chinese immigrants working on that railroad they were earning a dollar a day and then the other workers were irish immigrants from the east and they would come through the great plains and there were 10,000 of them also earning a dollar a day. Um, it was easier to build the part in the plains, you know, because it's flatter land. It's easier to get all your supplies from the East Coast. But it's it's done, and now it's easier for farmers to sell their, their, their meat and their crops. It's easier for miners to get in and mine the land for resources. It's easier for people to get in, in and out of the West. Um, so more and more Americans are going to move out West and they don't have to go on horse and buggy or wagon trains or by foot or on horseback. You can just, you know, go on a railroad and it takes you about one week to go from New York city to California. And you know, what's weird is it's 2020 and it still takes about one week to go from New York to California on a railroad it's mm. kind of funny so that's pretty much it for the notes unless you have any questions no sir all right if you have any questions about anything else grades or anything um i just have one question um yeah. so since we can do the um uh, for our end of the year grades, we can uh, decide whether we want it to, um, like, to have our actual grade or do a pass or fail. Is that for every class that we have, or do you just uh, get to pick one option for all it's, the classes? It's for it's for every class that you are currently in, like your fall semester classes. They are what they are, but any classes that you're in now, you have that option for. And I actually made a spreadsheet over the past week. And so you can, in a year-long class, what you can do is you can take your semester one grade, um, which is for you is really good. Um, or if your quarter three grade helps, you can use that averaged in and use that grade. Or if your quarter four and your quarter three together help your semester one grade, you can use all four quarters and you can use that grade as your final number grade and have that in your transcript. If, you're, if none of those three numbers help, then you can have your class graded as a pass-fail and you would get credit for passing the class and it wouldn't do anything to your GPA. Your GPA would just stay the same. Um, I looked up your... GPA, and I've got that in the spreadsheet for all of my classes. I think what would help, I think your semester one grade would help your GPA, and you could use that grade as your final grade if you wanted to do that. All right, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. Okay. 
Yeah, because I I put I put next to everybody. I tried to figure out which one would help the most, and there's only three people in the class that I would recommend using a pass fail for. Everybody else, one of those numbers would help them out. Okay. So, anything else? No, sir. All right. Well, um, I will have office hours if you need me for anything next Tuesday and Thursday at three. Um, there are still the 45 questions slash unit worksheet due for this unit. And that will be due on Tuesday before I enter those grades in. Um, but other than that, next Friday is just like a general question and answer kind of class. It probably won't take very long um, next Friday. So that's pretty much what we got. Okay. All right. So I will see you next time, Linda. All right. Bye. All right. Have a good day. You too. Thanks.